2017. Um, of course, PREP stands for Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies, which is the major and the minor that is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. And this series was designed to bring um, speakers who are, whose work is being taught in the classroom here at UFC. Um, so this, this, um, this event was suggested by Emily Laura Francie, who I'll introduce in one moment. Um, and she's invited, and we've invited, Professor Mohammed Mack from Smith College. Um, I want to thank Sarah Chewy for doing all the heavy lifting and organizing this event and, and making it possible for Professor Mack to be here. Uh, I also want to thank Camille Morgan and Alyssa Rodriguez for their work on making this program happen. Um, and before I introduce Emily, I want to tell you about another program, our final program of the year happening next Friday. It's going to be a film meeting and discussion. Um, the title of the film, I'm probably going to butcher, but Gurume, Afro-Andalusian Memories, and it's about the African influence in flamenco dance. So that's happening next Friday at 4 o'clock. Hope some of you will come back. Okay, Emily. <laughs> Emily Laura Francie is a PhD student in modern European and African history, and the course she's teaching for Crest this year, I mean, this quarter is called Making Postcolonial Europe. So her research interests include empire and colonialism, gender and sexuality, race, decolonization, rights and citizenship, science fiction and speculative fiction, France and the Francophone world, and Africa and the Atlantic world. So please join me in welcoming Emily Laura Francie. But it's really wonderful to see you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, a quick word of thanks in addition to the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture for sponsoring this talk, which is being held in conjunction with our Making Post-Colonial Europe course. It's lovely to see some of you from the first week. Um, so it is in that capacity that I am delighted to welcome Professor Mohammed Mack to speak today. Professor Mack comes to us from Smith College, where he is an assistant professor of French studies and associated with the his research focuses on questions of diversity, immigration, gender and sexuality, and politics, particularly in the study of Franco-Arab cultures. Along with his recent book, Sexagon, uh, Muslims, France, and the Sexualization of National Culture, published this year by Fordham University Press, he has been widely published across a range of academic and popular outlets, including the Journal of Arabic Literature, Heterograph, and Al Jazeera. So, Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Mohammed. I forgot my book, so it's good oh. that you have one. I know if you can pass it. Yeah. All right, let's get set up here. Okay, I lost. Oh no, there it is. Okay. So um, thank you everyone for coming tonight, uh, especially on a Friday. Um, um, I appreciate seeing you all here. Um, I'm gonna just cancel that. So one little warning, visual warning. This uh, the presentation is much more blue than it is normally, um, and that might affect maybe one slide. But I will uh, tell you about the sort of play of colors in the slide in question. Um, so, what should I do about this? Uh, outline of the structure. Um, and then I'm going to go into some analysis of the different images in the book. The book has about 15 images, um, and I take a lot of them from the fashion and nightlife world, and fashion photographers ask for a lot of money for their images. So thankfully, my university and the press, Fordham University uh, Press, helped me to acquire these images. Um, so, my book, Sexagon, studies uh, the French immigration debate and how gender and sexuality are politicized within it. Um, can I my camera? Um, so what I look at specifically is how gender and sexuality have now become criteria used in a citizenship test. Mm -hmm. So whereas before, um, values like uh, civic mm -hmm. aptitude or linguistic ability were used to judge uh, the integration of immigrants and their suitability for naturalization. 
now, in a more indirect way, it's about measuring um, the appropriateness of immigrants' attitudes on issues of gender and sexuality. Um, so I look at the, this question of how the immigration debate has been sexualized through five different lenses. And I take a cultural studies and discourse analysis approach to doing that. And roughly, these different lenses line up with my chapters. So the first chapter looks at um, activist and anti-racist discourse um, in the French banlieue, or multi-ethnic suburbs that um, surround the major French cities. And I look specifically about how, at how these activists talk about love, gender expression, and sexuality in the volume. The second chapter has to do with uh, psychoanalysis and psychoanalysts. And France is kind of special in the sort of esteem um, accorded to psychoanalysis and sort of the national culture. Um, psychoanalysts are often weighing in on issues of the day in op-eds. And I specifically look at conservative um, psychoanalysts and how they talk about immigration. So, you know, psychoanalysis gives us uh, a sophisticated vocabulary to talk about the sexual components, the sexual undercurrents of all major phenomena in society. And they use this expertise to talk about how Muslim immigration is going to upset the peace and the balance between opposite sexes in France. Um, and how it's going to be dangerous for things like sexual liberation. Uh, the third chapter talks about literature. I look at how um, inter-ethnic relationships are portrayed in literature between white and Arab partners. And I look specifically at a trope, the trope of the difficult or uncooperative Arab lover. Um, the fourth chapter is about film. And I pay attention to how film is used to conduct surveillance on immigrant private lives and to reach into sort of their intimate sphere. And the fifth chapter, which probably got me the most trouble with my dissertation committee, is on pornography, um, which I used to call erotica, and now I changed back to pornography. Um, but it looks at how uh, the major flashpoints of the immigration debate in France show up in both heterosexual and homosexual pornography, and actually offer more honest and, uh, I would say, deeper solutions to um, the tensions created by the immigration debate even if they are very politically correct. So uh, where I'm going to start is actually with that first chapter, the <coughs> chapter about um, activist discourse. I'm looking at anti-discrimination activists and anti-sexism activists and the work that they do in the volume. I'm going to put up the cover to the book so you can see it. Um, and so where I'll start this story is with a documentary that the TV channel Arte produced in uh, 2010 which was called La Cité du Mal. So mal, if you speak French, can mean uh, two things. Can anyone help me to say what those two things are? Dad. Dad and? Male. Male. Oh, male. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, also, yeah. <laughs> so the way that this, the title of this documentary is written is the city of males, or the city of the male, but mal is spelled as evil. Okay, so it's making a kind of connection between being male and being evil. And that's because there's been a lot of um, media speak about how the uh, French uh, multi-ethnic suburbs, the Bonlieu, especially those that count a lot of African and North African Muslim um, immigrants and their children, have created these kinds of patriarchal or phallocentric areas that are beyond the reach of state control. Uh, this is, of course, an exaggeration. But this is where the media, especially this documentary, is going. And one of the symptoms of this sort of virilization of um, society is um, apparently clothing. So there were a lot of media stories about women who were changing their clothing so as to better fit in in uh, these neighborhoods uh, where men seem to rule. And often these involve, uh, at least in the representations, um, removing all traces of femininity and wearing baggy clothes, and actually becoming men or androgenizing themselves. And so the narrator here, the narrator of this documentary, calls this a virility trap. I'm going to read now from one of the documentary's first scenes, where he's talking about two women, Imel and Melissa, 
who dress this way, who dress in a way that is described as garçon manqué or a tomboy style. So he says, Imel and Melissa are 20 years old. They know the projects by heart. They were born there. Sneakers, baggy jeans, and sweatsuits, they dress in the manner of tomboys, in French, à la bonhomme, as they say around here, to be at peace. Like most girls, Imel and Melissa do better at school than the boys. Both have degrees in work. In short, they seem rather emancipated in the projects. So I use this documentary to talk about something called the banlieue uniform. And I mean that both in the sense of kind of monochromatic or very um, communitarian kind of clothes that repress individuality, but also in the sense of something that effaces gender expressions. Right? Um, and I kind of contest that narrative that Banlieu clothes or street style or urban wear repress gender. Um, Oftentimes, um, this uh, is seen in sort of clothing styles that emphasize athletic wear, sporty clothes, uh, you know, um, soccer jerseys, and so on. And what I try to say in the book that is that urban wear and street style and athletic wear can actually signify something else, which is urban belonging or implantation in a given neighborhood and attachments to certain codes and communities. I also kind of stress that athletic wear is something that can be feminized. It's not just something that represses the feminine, and it is not necessarily repressing an erotic allure for both for men and women. And a lot of these subjects play with sort of the erotic components of sportswear. Um, so this is a phenomenon of women when wearing baggy clothes or wearing androgynous clothes so as to resemble men or not be bothered by men and by sexual harassment. Uh, this has been explored in another media phenomenon that revolves around girl gangs, or gangs led and constituted by women. Uh, there were two films that really sort of gave a visual illustration of this. One came out in 2001, and it's called La Squad. And La Squad in French is kind of like a, uh, a woman warrior that can't be restrained. Uh, but it's actually a kind of bird, but it's it's kind of has this Amazon almost connotation to it. Um, and the other film is Bon de Fille, which is available actually in the U.S. under the name uh, Girlhood. I highly recommend watching it. Uh, it came out in 2014. Um, so both the films um, show kind of the influence of this virility culture on women's wear, and specifically on women's gender expressions. Both of the uh, protagonists um, in these films pass through cycles of butchness and effeminacy. They're constantly changing their hairstyles. Uh, one uh, actually audience member at one of the talks said that both these films are just as much a story about hair as they are about um, anything else and what hair can mean. Um, and especially after the, the uh, two protagonists um, become, sort of start to adopt a Bush gender expression, they also develop um, romantic interests in other women. You can see this in some of the scenes from uh, Girlhood, from Bon de Fille. Uh, the main character, Vic, uh, short for Victoire. This is the main character uh, after um, she changes her hairstyle to uh, adopt cornrows, and this is when she uh, becomes a, a, dr a drug dealer, actually, and leaves home. This is her earlier in the film uh, with her uh, male uh, romantic interest. This is her later with a uh, female uh, romantic interest. Um, so what I found interesting about these films, and yeah, of course the films have problematic <coughs> aspects of what, as well. For instance, uh, one of the problematic aspects is the women, uh, the two protagonists in their sex scenes are constantly uh, portrayed as being indis indistinguishable from their male lovers during the sex scenes. And this is done through a very like intricate uh, play on light. Um, but what's interesting too is that um, you see in both films um, women leading games and sometimes leading games that also incorporate men. Um, and I use these films to show how Bollywood women can actually set a standard for virility or participate in what virility means, independently of men, 
and thus divorce what we traditionally conceive of as virility from the male sex or assignation to the male sex. So I tried to come up with a kind of neologism in the book to describe that process, and I used the word non-gender virility to talk about this phenomenon, which I think you could see in any major urban center with a significant post-colonial minority. I mean, you could say the same thing about New York City or Australia. Um, I also identified certain paradoxes in the representation of uh, androgyny in the media among uh, volume populations. And it seemed to me like androgyny was definitely a positive outcome when it came to men, but not necessarily when it came to women. Um, it was considered desirable in volume men who are quote unquote too virile because it is conducive towards things like uh, metrosexuality or a more evolved, evolved in quotes, masculinity. But undesirable in women because it is only seen as derivative of virilism or patriarchy and not a kind of alternative or queer gender expression in itself. And I try to understand how saying about Bonnier populations that they can never be queer or that they cannot produce any kind of innovation in regards to gender expression, that this is a kind of punitive sentence. It's a punitive sentence that imposes sort of anti-modernity on them, that they cannot be makers of things, that everything they're doing is kind of derivative. Um, and we see this also not just with girl gangs, but with um, Bonnier men who correspond to a, a type, or I should say a stereotype, of the homothone, or in French you would say racaille gay. And racaille is a very pejorative word that means uh, scum, but it also means thug, uh, those kinds of words, right? And these are words that are used to designate sort of the more boisterous or you know assertive or aggressive um, in speech and manner of, uh, residents of the body. Um, and so there. There was a book that came out that uh, really got to sort of the bottom of these issues. And um, it starts with an interview of just one such person uh, called Majid. And it says, Majid, Rakai et Pédé. And that translates to uh, Majid, uh, uh, Thug and Faget. And and is written in italics, right? That's the first chapter. Um, and the author, Franck Chaumont, who collected all these interviews, he's a former journalist, um, he expresses a lot of disappointment that this uh, anonymous interviewee, Majid, who's using a different name, he expresses disappointment that this character uh, remains in the banlieue and does not want to move to the city center or the neighborhood. And there's a certain disappointment, and he feels this functional, the journalist, he feels this as a kind of personal failure, that he was not able to sort of impart to this younger uh, generation of, of gay people of color uh, how important it is to sort of leave your family ties and make a new life for yourself in the gay neighborhood, uh, a life that you choose. Um, and so he sees that as sort of a failure of the gay movement. So I'm going to say a little bit more about this journalist. So Franck Chaumont actually used to work at a um, Arab interest radio station called Beur FM, which plays mainly hip hop and Arabic music, and is also kind of a community radio station. Um, and one day he decided to do a program about a Banlieue residents' um, attitudes about sexuality and homosexuality. And he was kind of shocked with the calls that he was getting over the air, and he decided to do a more in-depth report. Um, so this is the cover of his book, and because of the, uh, what I told you about, about the blue uh, tint, you can't really see the actual color of this, but just imagine that this window shade and this letter is bright pink, like Barbie pink, okay? Um, so the, the book uh, features a, a cover image which is almost as bleak as its content, uh, showing a... Um, tower housing block, a social housing tower block, which is uh, in the brutalist style of architecture, very heavy concrete designed to sort of resist a nuclear winter. Um, and 
what this suggests to me, so this is the only window shade which is actually pink in color, all the rest are gray. Um, so pink, as we know, is the color of uh, gay liberation, uh, uh, and also suggests privacy, intimacy, something vulnerable. The gray around it suggests a kind of crushing and monochromatic um, communitarianism. And in French, communitarianism is a kind of bad word which is synonymous with uh, segregation or ethnic separatism, the tendency of people to want to live amongst themselves. And you know, this is a kind of, uh, this is sort of lost in translation um, when moving towards the US context because community doesn't have a pejorative association the way it does in France. So it's important to remember that before I say more. Um, of course, communitarianism is not necessarily chosen. It's not always the case that ethnic minorities choose to be among those who are similar. Sometimes it is because of decisions about concentrating immigrants or the urban poor in certain areas that has led to communitarianism. Also blocks to sort of upward mobility with getting apartments or getting job uh, or applying for jobs. These can increase communitarianism. So, um, so what I say in the first chapter of the book about this cover is that the pinkness here in this one window almost seems as a kind of um, artificial addition, something that doesn't belong there, something maybe that was unnaturally grafted onto the volume, and it ignores the extent to which the queer or alternative sexuality or down low sexuality in the volume uh, has long-standing roots, not just in the banlieue, but in the cultures that the migrants um, who moved to the banlieue brought with them. Um, and <coughs> what I'm trying to identify in the first chapter is how uh, both the mainstream gay press and kind of testimony, for instance, from the radio show that Chaumont did interviewing local banlieue residents about homosexuality, both of those discourses sort of present um, homosexuality as something that is beleaguered, that doesn't belong. And homosexuality for the gay mainstream press is something that is, uh, needs to be saved or recovered from a hostile environment. And structurally, that's kind of similar to how the sort of homophobic uh, Bon Yuzah who called into the radio station, that's sort of similar to the way they see things, which is that Queerness also doesn't belong there, and it needs to be stigmatized and identified and called out for the purposes of expulsion, right? So neither of those approaches, even the one that is sort of friendly to homosexuals in the banlieue, doesn't um, want to imagine how queerness could be indigenously produced in the banlieue. And the only solution is to leave the banlieue and make a new life in the city center. So, of course, uh, this is a point of view that I kind of critique. Um, and for a long time, this book was sort of the uh, Bible on uh, issues of homosexuality in the banlieue. It was picked up by all the major news publications. Uh, this is a review from the magazine called Les Inrocutifs, or Les Inrocs, which is kind of like the French uh, Rolling Stone. And it really just lifted verbatim his conclusions, didn't try to contest his conclusions, or uh, interview anyone else for another opinion. What was interesting is that after the release of Homo Ghetto, um, a lot of the respondents, the people who were interviewed, broke their anonymity to sort of condemn the book and say that they didn't agree with the way they were represented, which was a kind of very selective representation that Shomon took <laughs> Uh, the bits of conversation that lined up with his narrative and didn't include. Uh, these are things that don't go together. And because they don't go together, it's funny. Right? So there's another slide uh, which um, encapsulates this, which kind of generates humor based on this juxtaposition that doesn't really go to, uh, that of these two things that don't go together. And this is a uh, vignette called uh, Rakeket. Um, Raqueket is a play on the word racketeering and the slang diminutive of penis in French, quequette, in which Momo demands a twinkish gay teenager's phone, saying, give me your 06, in what appears to be an attempt to steal it. This strip shows that Momo may lambast the effeminacy of heterosexual sex, 
but desire and love effeminate male partners. As the illustrated hearts around Momo's head in another vignette make clear. Give me your 06, the title of the strip, is another way of asking for a French cell phone number, as almost all cell numbers begin with those two digits. When the twink, a gay slang term for youngish looking men without much body hair, nervously relinquishes the device, Momo says, I only want your phone number, you idiot. The startled teenager stutters an answer, and Momo leaves him standing there disoriented, walking away with an over-the-shoulder, I'll call you. Hearts appear in the teenager's eyes as he mutters to himself, what a crazy guy. So I'm going to switch gears now and actually talk about one person who pushed back against this book, Momo Geto, and his name is uh, Fuad Zerawi. You can see him here on the left uh, in the toupee. Uh, he's a nightlife promoter, and he ran this club called Black Bomber, and every week on Sunday he had a, a different toupee. They were all really marvelous. <laughs> uh, but the story of the club is interesting, how this club came to be, and it's still going. I think it's celebrating its 18th anniversary uh, this year, which is an eternity for any gay club night. So Black Blonde uh, filled a nightlife void in the Paris gay scene uh, in the <coughs> mid-90s. Um, because, oh, and I should say a little bit about why this club was created. So the club actually was the idea of Fouad Zerawi. Uh, he was very frustrated by the fact that he couldn't get into the most happening uh, gay clubs in the, in the Marais, or the gay river of Paris. Um, he saw a lot of other people from the banlieue rejected from gay clubs, which are supposed to be very accommodating and let everyone in, right? Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to get into the sort of quotas that exist for women in certain French gay clubs, but this was uh, even um, directed against uh, uh, men who didn't have the right dress code or were not read as visibly gay. Um, so he created a club in a different part of town in Kigal, which used to be less gentrified than it is today, and is a red light district, but also is a transitional neighborhood where a lot of immigrants and their families land and maybe move somewhere else. But you have a very interesting mix of populations, a synergy between sex workers, also trans sex workers in this neighborhood, um, and um, immigrants and their descendants and a whole uh, a nightlife population that descends there um, Friday and Saturday nights on the weekends. So the other difference about this club is you can see that it starts at 8 o'clock. Is that a normal starting time for a club? <laughs> Those of you who go out every night? <laughs> it's not. It's a tea dance, right? Mm -hmm. It's something, and it used to start even earlier. It used to start at 5. And the reason for this was that the trains which link Paris up with the banlieue uh, tend to, to uh, have more abbreviated schedules. Uh, midnight, maybe during the week, up to 1.30 or 2 on uh, the weekends. But um, what it does is it affords sort of the people who go to this club a kind of alibi, that you can come home at a respectable time. It's just like coming back from uh, an outing in Paris, right? It was also not a conspicuous club, so you could enter without being seen to enter into a gay club. And Pigalle is not a gay neighborhood, so you could visit that neighborhood without sort of being identified or outed by others. Uh, so, <coughs> Franck Chaumont, uh, the person who wrote Homo Ghetto, and Fouad Zerawi used to be uh, creative collaborators. Uh, they worked together at that radio station I, called, I told you about, uh, Radio Beur. Uh, but their friendship hit a kind of snag with the release of Chaumont's book, Homo Ghetto. Um, Zerawi kind of disagreed with the portrayal of uh, this Bollywood population, and he felt that he was justified in pushing back because he actually sees this Bollywood gay population at his club every week, and he had different conclusions to make. Um, and to this day, this, uh, so, the, I'm sorry, I should backpedal a little bit. So, is Fuad Zerawi <coughs> asked uh, to set up a debate? in the leading gay uh, interest magazine at the time, Take Two magazine. Uh, and they had a debate in one of their issues, um, and uh, that debate was really the only prominent 
pushback that I found, uh, besides the uh, respondents who wanted to sort of recant some of their testimony, right? But this was one article amidst like 50 other articles that just praised the book on And um, they're talking in this section of the debate that I'm going to read from about nightlife, because this is Fouad Zahawi's uh, domain. But nightlife was also, became kind of politicized uh, in um, sort of representations of the banlieue with a lot of news stories about how banlieue men and women used to bring backpacks onto trains going to Paris so that they could change clothes and actually dress the way they wanted to dress when they went to nightclubs uh, or dress in more skimpy clothes or more uh, maybe effeminate clothes too, right? And these stories were mainly from about uh, eight to ten years before they're having this debate. So in this way, clothing is very much politicized because the decisions about clothing reflect a larger uh, grappling with sexism that comes from immigration, supposedly. So Zerawi here is presenting a different point of view. I'm going to read now from the debate. Zerawi says, I see burr and blacks Arabs and blacks in a completely different manner. You talk about Arabs who go change at Lial, a train station in the center of Paris, but they don't even have to change anymore because heterosexual Arabs today dress exactly like them. With tight-fitting pink shirts, they go to shisha bars or hookah bars. They are devilishly sexy. They have mohawks. They've adopted the same sartorial look as gay people. Everything has changed. The trend is no longer set by thugs. They don't have anything to say anymore. Then later in the interview, uh, Zerawi says, for me, your book is 10 years old. That's how things were 10 years ago. So what's interesting is that before the media has picked up on this trend that Zerawi is, is talking about, the fashion world became interested in these sort of changing habits of dress. Right? Um, so I'm going to show you an image from uh, the male folk the Book Homme International uh, from 2003-2004. And this was an issue that was exclusively devoted to male models of color. Um, and the title is also a play on words. These play on words can be a little tiresome after a while. <laughs> this is uh, Chador. And Chador is a play on words of, uh, maybe you guys can help me. What and what? J'adore, which means in French. I love it. And? Chador, which is? Veil. Veil, or uh, the kind of full body veil that is worn in Europe. Right. So, inside, oh, on the cover, I should say, first of all, you see uh, this is actually an Olympic gold medalist athlete uh, named uh, Brahim Asloum. He's a boxer, a lightweight boxer. Um, he won a gold medal in Sydney. And he became a kind of uh, sex symbol, but also a fashion icon because of his sort of uh, interesting self-stylings and self manicure So you can see he has the kind of bleached blonde hair, uh, a la Cisco, and he has a grill here uh, made of diamonds, and it's called Jeddah. Interestingly, uh, Brahim Asloum, who actually grew up in the Bonio, um, became a gay sex symbol as well. He made the cover of Titu magazine, the gay, the leading gay interest magazine twice, and he actively cultivated his gay fandoms. Um, in the magazine, you can see a lot of the different components of Bollywood street style, which is evident in um, manicured facial hair, diamond studs, uh, soccer style or mohawk-like haircuts, uh, boxing shoes, tight leather jackets, and form-fitting sweatpants. Um, inside the issue, we have a photo shoot with Asloum, where he is wearing bondage gear, and he is in a kind of Dali, Salvador Dali-esque uh, S&M scenario, where he's being strangulated by watches, that melting watches that look like corsets. <laughs> it's a very interesting movie. But I talk about in another chapter of the book about how Arab actors and Arab models constantly have to go through a process of homosexualization in order to make it in the industry. Um, that it sort of attenuates their difference in a way. Um, so this, uh, art, this um, issue is quite special because it was one of the first to show um, Arab and black models exclusively. 
And the inside photo shoot uh, shot by the, <coughs> photo, um, the, the photographer Rankin um, shows a lot of images where the line between homosociality and homosexuality are, are blurred, is blurred. Uh, things like the like uh, men locking arms or holding hands, which is kind of redolent of um, signs of uh, same-sex uh, affectivity in the uh, Middle East, but generally in the, in the global South also. We see uh, people who incarnate the uh, bouncer type. There's a lot in the French media about how um, Especially men of color who go to colleges, who go to college, can't find jobs and end up working as security guards. So it's kind of borrowing from that. We see haircuts uh, that are based on um, etchings that are kind of atavistic in nature, and these uh, etchings were called tribal, and they were actually um, they were the uh, these stem actually from the West African influence on Paris. Uh, and barbers from Côte d'Ivoire who came and uh, popularized these kinds of haircuts. Uh, we also see uh, eyebrows uh, split in two on purpose, not because of uh, an injury, but to signify a kind of combative posture or a life of sort of uh, a life of toughness. Uh, we also see men uh, holding their, their crotches or having their arms near their crotches, and this is a second image uh, from the same photo shoot. Um, so, and you can see here there's a sort of combination of elements of street style with haute couture um, and uh, a sort of active blurring of the line between just platonic male signs of affection and homosexuality. Um, so, I use actually this photo shoot to talk about the phenomenon of cross pollination. Um, and Cross-pollination is useful because we see how um, trends can migrate from one community to another. And Zerawi, in that quote that I read from, was talking about how uh, gay Arabs and quote-unquote straight Arabs uh, actually borrow from each other. They're conversant with each other, each other, and they don't necessarily live in parallel but separate worlds. Um, so, Cross-pollination is actually uh, something that is talked about a lot in sort of the gay art scene in France. Uh, there's this journalist named Didier Lestrade, who was the founder, one of the founders of ACT UP and one of the founders of Pitchy Magazine, who wrote a book that's just basically about trends in gay culture, and he was talking about, for instance, the, the mustache. And he said the mustache became popularized in the gay community because actually it was lifted from uh, Latino immigrants and the Latino population of the city. And it goes back and forth, right? It got popularized in a certain uh, gay scene, it went back to the mainstream, and back and forth and back and forth. You could argue that the same kind of uh, phenomenon exists in uh, house music, for instance, something that started in the African American communities of uh, Chicago, uh, techno started in Detroit, uh, went to the gay community, also went overseas, changed, came back to the States, and dance music is a popular pop form. Right? Um, of course, uh, cross-pollination is not always um, equitable in the way it borrows. It can co-opt, it can distort, but it is nevertheless an important phenomenon, especially in the formulation of trends, both fashion and musical. Um, so another uh, Bonlieu phenomenon that kind of illustrates this cross-pollination I'm talking about is a French uh, dance trend called the uh, tectonique that kind of embarrasses French people whenever it's brought up, but I think it's really amazing. French people, especially who are embarrassed by tectonique, will say it looks like someone is uh, having uh, epilepsy or is having a seizure or something like that. But really, it's um, it has a lot of complexity, and it's based on a kind of combination of uh, martial arts, modern dance, uh, extreme feats of flexibility, and an emphasis on upper body movement, more than lower body movement, uh, reenacting gestures from video games, especially Street Fighter, uh, mangas, and uh, reenactments of male personal toilet gestures like running gel through the hair or fixing a beard that is not styled properly so as to sort of insult the person that you're having a dance battle with. Right? And this is an image uh, by Takao Oshima from the same uh, Tetsu magazine issue 
where functional moral influence and how we were having a debate. And the title of this photo series uh, about tectonique was called Is Tectonique uh, Crypto-Homo? Is it something that can be read as, as, as gay? Uh, and what you see in uh, the interviews with these men, these, these, so I should say first that tectonique emerged from the banlieue. Uh, and that's important to go against the narrative that nothing interesting is produced or comes out of the banlieue. Uh, and what we see are uh, self-declared straight men who engage with androgyny in visual spectacular ways. Men wear makeup, glitter, uh, they imitate Sailor Moon and other kind of um, fantastical mangas like that. Um, and who are nevertheless secure in their uh, sexualities and who also don't deny that they might be gay either. Um, so what's interesting is that this uh, photo shoot appeared in the same issue with the debate I just told you about, but also an investigative report um, about uh, men uh, and women living in the Bonyu uh, and sort of the oppression they face. And that report was penned by Fadel Amara, who you might know from the organization or neither sluts nor dormants, which was an anti-sexism organization that fought against um, homophobia and sexual violence in the Bolivia. And uh, this person who wrote the report, Fadil Amara, she was, uh, you know, she became the darling of the, so of the French uh, Socialist Party and was actually hired as a minister later in Nicolas Sarkozy's government. So she went from being a Bolivia community organizer to a um, minister in a right-wing government. And the issue, that issue itself was just interesting because it had totally contradictory viewpoints about being gay in the Bonlieu. Both Fouad Zerawi saying that uh, Bonlieu, gay and lesbian people are trendsetters, and also he said something quite controversial, which is that he believed that Bonlieu, gay men and women were less oppressed than straight men and women from the Bonlieu when it came to hiring or getting jobs or getting apartments and so on. Um, and then we have on the other side um, representations of the Bonlieu as an inhospitable place for the queer. Um, but I think this phenomenon like Tectonique and all the other stuff I'm talking about just shows that um, alternative gender expressions, whether straight or gay, can emerge in these spaces despite what the media um, suggests. So I'll leave it there, and I'll take the questions. Actually, I, I was really um, interested in like, the very last thing you said, and how like, there's this almost trend of like oppressed groups being seen as trendsetters. And you said in the same way how like, lots of um, like fascist house come out of community colors are like, appropriate within queer communities too. Right. Um, and I was hoping like give you more like thoughts on that because I just find it's like a super interesting trend. Yeah. Um, so I think the way I see it is like I I'm just gonna admit it. I spent a lot of time in nightclubs. Um, <laughs> even while I was doing the dissertation research, and I always said that I'm here for research. You know, I tried many times to interview Fouad Zahawi, but he never said yes. He was very suspicious of me. Um, but I think, like, I also, I tried to find traces of what he was talking about. And I do think that, for instance, you saw amid sort of the general uh, Bonlieu population that you might see at, like, major transit hubs like Riyadh or Châtelet, uh, you saw, for instance, uh, men um, wearing, uh, there was a trend for pink at one point. There was a trend for um, uh, stenciled eyebrows, uh, for um, lacquer, or lacquer, um, lacquer nails. Uh, there, was, there was this whole sort of period where men were wearing gray sweatpants to sort of show what's going on, you know, uh, and emphasizing sort of their shape. And I think it's interesting because I'm not sure if in American street fashion or like the equivalent of what these this Bonio population would be in America, you see the same kind of sexualization of the of the of men of color. Right? But it seems that uh, these men, just anecdotally, are very aware of like the possibility for autoeroticization and they enjoy playing with that. And clothing designers that they buy from, even things like H and M or Top Man, really play with that. You know? Um, 
And of course, you know, I, I don't want to. What I'm doing in this presentation is not saying that you know homophobia doesn't exist or that repression doesn't exist. But I just want to allude to the fact that uh, these kinds of cross pollinations are going on, and uh, these uh, young people are very influential in sort of the city center in determining what new fashion trends are. For instance, Jean Paul Gaultier, who is a legendary fashion designer declared that he got, he got all of his ideas from watching um, Arab and black gangs in the train stations. And that, that to him, a, a girl gang is the image for him of what a modern French woman is, not the sort of classically skinny and very effeminate and seductive uh, French woman, but a more tomboyish nest. Right? And Jean-Paul Gaultier was also one of the first to really feature black and Arab models before others. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? Thank you, Mohamed. Yeah. Um, it was really fascinating with, especially your sort of genealogy of the like, mustache and of house music as well, with certain tribes. And, um, another sort of explosion in Paris over the past 10 years has been ballroom. Yes, and, and productive. I mean, you know, with like BBB also, you know, like um, it's kind of all in the air there. <laughs> so I'm interested, um, Kitty Smile, for, uh, who's really big in the, in the ballroom community there, um, is a DJ and also uh, walks with the House of Mizrahi mm -hmm. and like has a music video, but it does chronicle this narrative of sort of changing clothes. Oh, it does. And okay. leaving from his yeah. um, house with his mom to then um, go out and, and walk a ball, essentially, uh -huh. um, as in the butch um, category. Right. So it is putting on a wig and things like that. And so there's still, um, and I think it was 2013, 2014, um, but there seems to be some, some maybe uh, some life still to the narrative of like changing clothes mm -hmm. on trains, especially around um, gender non-normativity. Right. And so I'm wondering in your, um, as you were sort of coming across pieces or interviews that were pushing back against the narrative of changing clothes, whether it was um, folding into the sort of like, well, it was 10 years ago, as in everyone's updated now, mm -hmm. and the trends don't align with sort of um, those who accept and those who don't accept homosexuality, or if there's also maybe this sort of um, this pushback that is saying we defy even the norms within the um, acceptable grounds. I don't know if that makes sense. Can you say more just about the last part? Well, we yeah, so, so, I, so in, um, in the comment that the book seemed about 10 years old, yeah. as though the Bonnie had been popular. Right, right, right. Okay. And so is that the sort of, do you see other trends where it's like, oh, actually, we're with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or is it actually, it's a, it's a different thing entirely, and you can't quite comprehend the complexity of maybe gender expression, et cetera? Well, I do think that because it's a debate, they're, per, they're presenting very divergent views on purpose, mm -hmm. and they're not going to acknowledge the strengths of the other's argument. Um, so I think what I sense in that interview is that Fouad Zehawi is trying to counteract a kind of representational trend called miserabilism. Or in, in, uh, representations of the banlieue that stress uh, failure, poverty, the cycle of not being able to improve upon your parents' generation, uh, unhappiness, sexual unfulfillment, romantic unfulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, and so he is presenting a selective genealogy, for sure. But he's just he just wants Chauvin to know all the phenomena that he sees in his club where people don't change. You know, what's funny about this club is that you have, yes, you have what they call the Beyoncé, or the people who you know, are very uh, uh, flamboyant and don't hide anything. But you also have uh, the stereotype of the uh, homo thug who dresses uh, as if to pass, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want to suggest that they're suffering from false consciousness and that's just, the, that's just a strategy not to be harassed. They actually love the culture of that clothes and eroticize those clothes. Right. I mean, I think you could say so many, so many of the same things about any of the um, fetish communities in the mainstream gay community. You know, uh, you know, leather or whatever it is, right? Um, but 
to go back to what you said about uh, changing clothes. Uh, so, because I'm working with representations, I haven't really like done my own kind of uh, eth ethnography about it. Mm -hmm. I personally haven't seen that happen. And I've, I've gone to these. I actually went to this club from Sin Sandini, which is a bon you. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to sort of go to that club and see who's going with you uh, from the train. And you know, some people might be a little bit nervous. And, Who's following me? Who's going to see me going to this place? But uh, I just felt I I think I agree with Zerali that there's less and less concern about where am I going? Who's following me? Uh, at least in the ten years that have elapsed. And I think this, I mean I could say the same thing about America. When I was uh, you know closeted in high school, uh, ten years later those two periods have nothing to do with each other. You know even in this country. Um, but about uh, ballroom, so I forgot to say that a lot of people saw tectonic sort of traces of the ballroom scene. Mm -hmm. And Bebe Bebe, Be, like you're saying, actually became a place for the development of the French ballroom scene. And that's interesting because of the film um, Paris is Burning and taking Vogue back to Paris mm -hmm. in a way. And of course that film has, has problems and kind of doesn't, you know, the people who created the Vogue scene don't necessarily have the credit they deserve or the remuneration they deserve. Um, but Vogue, French Vogue, has become really, really sophisticated. Um, Vice magazine did a long documentary about it. And one of the dancers from um, the French Vogue scene, uh, Lissandra, I think, won the, the world, world hip-hop competition dance battle. Uh, and so that was an interesting moment, because the world hip-hop competition is definitely, I would say, a kind of macho space. But they had a, and Lissandra is trans and was competing against uh, cis woman, right, and won. Um, so I think that, uh, and, and, and also this word, les béoncés, that's what they call people who go to this club, like there's the kind of name for them. Uh, yeah, so I hope I answered some of the questions. <laughs> uh, I saw you first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a remark that I wanted to make for when you showed the uh, cover mm -hmm. of Shannon's book, and because I guess it's monochromatic for me, it, it's a succession of H's. A succession of H. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, mm -hmm. uh, really Which would line up with HLM? HLM, HLM, and HOMO. Oh so my gosh, yeah. The application of H. I wish I had met you before I wrote this book. <laughs> <laughs> so HLM means Habitation à Loyer Modéré, uh, affordable apartment, affordable housing. <coughs> and H is also H is in HOMO. Then you slip H in. Yeah, and it's true that H is like a building block, yeah. kind of, it's funny. Mm -hmm. I need, I see I'm not that visually sophisticated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I saw more hands. Yes? Um, yeah, so uh, you seem to rely a lot on queer theory, and I think you mentioned Judith Butler in the in introduction. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to, like, kind of the extent to which these identities that are pursued in the Bangu are, like, meta commentaries on the advancement of like modern gay identities mm -hmm. um, and are they more just kind of like self-adopted liberatory identities that don't really have to do with any knowledge of like queerness mm -hmm. as a subject like self-reflexive like, self reflexive yeah self like yeah. yeah kind of to what extent is it self-reflexive what is that is it not really aware of that and yeah. That's, a little, that's kind of a big question. Um, I would say that the populations represented here don't really use that word, queer. Uh, maybe they haven't, you know, it's not entirely true. There are some people who are, who are university students, who you'll see there, who are interested um, in sort of Malia street style as an art artistic expression. One of them became a filmmaker himself, his name is uh, Tarek Lacrisi. Very interested in working with him. Uh, but um, I think I, I struggled with that. I struggled with whether uh, what I'm talking about, like words like homophobic or vulnerable or hakai gay, are um, emic or etic notions. Are they used by the people um, concerned? And in a way, what I'm kind of interested in is sort of the nonverbal side of this, that you can just um, incarnate an identity through your clothes or through your body language that doesn't necessarily have a name. And I think that might be, if we're looking, talking about queer theory, you could see it as a kind of resistance to this um, 
this will to know, like in Michel Foucault, or the imperative to disclose and confess everything about your sexuality, mm -hmm. and to sort of actively cultivate maybe even a kind of nostalgia for pre-liberation gay uh, sociability. Um, and that could be dangerous because you are romanticizing perhaps a kind of homosexuality which uh, existed in the shadows because it had to and not because it was a choice. Um, but I think it's interesting the choice, and maybe it is not entirely a choice, but there are definitely people who have the choice to move to the gay city center and are not doing so and are finding fulfilling conditions for themselves in the banlieue and never going to the city center and carving out kind of online personas, online lives for themselves. And there's also, and I'm sorry to say that, there is a kind of, I've noticed at least in the personal ads sphere, a kind of ethnic separatism. Mm -hmm. You'll see people who say, cousin for cousin, or cousin for cousin. That is a code for like another guy from the Bali or another black or usually Arab, Arab guys when they say cousin, or bon yuzak or bon yuzak people who are called me you, outside of the scene. And they'll say things like, pas de pas, which is really crass, but that means no pork, and it means no uncircumcised penises. Yeah. Uh, and that is a way to sort of discriminate against people who are not uh, Muslim, or, or Jewish, too. You know, you see people who filter people that way. But of course, personal ads are rife with all kinds of sexual racism. Um, and this is maybe a form of it, but uh, I just find it interesting how people are, are bypassing the city center and forming uh, connections between Bolivia, different Bolivians rather than the city center. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I'm trying to restrain myself because um, you're, I got to spend a couple of hours with your book earlier this week and just loved it and it um, knit a lot of things together in my head that I had been thinking about for a while. Um, so I have sort of two questions that I'm trying to narrow down here. Um, but I spent five months earlier this year, well, on a research fellowship in Paris living at Chateau Rouge, so just living right on the edge of the Gouta, which is a neighborhood you mentioned and go into a little bit in your book, and it's on basically the northern edge of Paris. It's historically a very working class neighborhood, and uh, um, going back to the 19th century, a place where immigrant communities were highly policed. It's now called a zone sensible in Paris. Um, it's... Uh, so, and it's also um, the particular area where I was living in is a real meeting ground, literally block to block, and often um, physically um, between a Maghreb population, like a very Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan population, and West Africans. Mm -hmm. So, um, Africans who are very visibly black from Mali or Senegal or Ghana, and then um, those who are Arabic, and so basically I spent these many months um, doing my work there, but thinking about masculinity and gender expression every single day in terms of um, the ways in which um, French police would be, city police or so on, would be policing different populations in terms of their criminality, and then in terms of the sorts of performance of masculinity from a lot of times groups of guys that would just be standing outside in the street because <laughs> um, and who would change their entire comportment. So um, just uh, anyway, so your book I just threw off all of these um, questions in my head. So one question that I have for you, um, in terms of thinking about how queer expression is kind of denied in official discourse in the bon lieu is something that can't possibly happen unless it's somewhere like cute and sanctioned in the Marais, for example, where there's brunch and it's, you know, um, that one way in which I was thinking about this is that to admit queer expression in the banlieue is in a certain way to, um, okay, let me back up. Um, I was also present in, in France during a, a violent attack against a young man who was put in, who was detained by police um, unlawfully, it turns out, and who was um, sodomized yeah. Yeah. during his arrest. And his, young, his name is Théo, he's from a banlieue called Omni. And in this banlieue, in the fall, there had been a very violent altercation in which two police sitting in a car had, that car had been um, set on fire and the doors had been locked. So this was a very hot banlieue. And um, so the, this was caught on video, this young man's attack. And in any case, um, there was tremendous response. Obviously, there's demonstrations in Paris. And yeah. what I was thinking about in response to, in re re reflecting to your project is that 
in a strange way, um, you need to deny the presence of a kind of, as you call it, indigenous queerness within the banlieue in order for this kind of state-sponsored, um, the, the symbolic power of that sodomization by the state to be able to take place. That, mm -hmm. that, that the banlieue has to be the bottom only to the state and in a violent way. And um, so I, I guess I was wondering, can you, <laughs> sorry, I'm going no, in all directions here. I really like yeah. put this book through too many things in my head. But um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, is there a way in which you can parse a little bit the distinction between how sexuality is politicized or criminalized, perhaps in, re in re reflection um, or in dialogue with its ideological <laughs> potential between something like um, a black uh, guy from the banlieue as opposed to an Arab. Um, so partly I'm thinking about the fact that while black guys from the banlieue, at least in those that I knew, those who, in the experience that I had while I was there, um, they will be criminalized, but not necessarily seen as a sort of ideological threat to the state. Mm -hmm. Like they're not bringing Islam, they're not, they're not threatening to change the way that women dress, which is such a huge part of how patriarchy is working, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so, can, maybe I'll just shut myself up here. <laughs> but can you, can you um, yeah. sort of pull those things apart? I'm thinking, um, to, to give a couple of specific examples of, for example, the film, um, the, I think it was translated as The Untouchables or The Intouchables, in Les Intouchables yeah. with Omar Sy, who uh, is this, a black guy who becomes an assistant to a quadriplegic bourgeois man. Um, and the joke of the film is basically that he's this incredibly sexy man, and mm -hmm. why can't he get the other female assistant to sleep with him, and at the end it's because she's a lesbian. But his sexuality, his virility, is kind of celebrated in a strange way. And whereas and the virility... Tied with ableism. Completely, yeah. completely. Whereas um, the virility of, um, of Maghrebians, for example, or the, um, those of um, North African origin that uh, just in the scenes that I was witnessing every day is much more linked to a, a, a sort of threat of contamination of, of distribution of reproduction and, and of a kind of contamination of these overarching patriarchal structures that are already in place in the French state. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, that's a whole tangle of stuff. No, that gives me a lot to think about. Um, so first, I would say that I'm reminded of um, two films. Um, and I don't know if you got to the film chapter yet, but no. a, you'll, see, you'll see when you get there. But uh, there is a film in, called uh, La Squadre, which I talked mm -hmm. about where an Arab character avenges his sister's gang rape at the hands of a black gang leader oh, wow. by uh, sodomizing him with a baton. And that was many years before this happened, but it shows wow. that that yeah. is a practice yeah. that is in the imaginary. And there's a, another film uh, called Massité va uh, by, um, I think his name is Jean-Pierre Genet, the director. He did the movie uh, Mystery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of violent, patriarchal kind of film. Uh, but he has a film where he talks about the sadistic practices of the police against lonely young men. And what happens in that scene is it's, a, it's a three French policemen who have southern French accent, accents, mm -hmm. and they're portrayed as quinoa, or European formerly settled population in Algeria. And they start talking, they, they find this guy who was participating in a riot, he's a North African guy, and uh, they start uh, taunting him, and the way they try, he doesn't, he's not responsive, so the way they really get under his skin is by making out with him, kissing him, and touching his genitals, right? And they actually get very excited um, about it. And what, I, I used those scenes to talk about how there's a specific kind of homosexuality that can arise between people who are not homosexual mm -hmm. because of power dynamics mm -hmm. and because it's the best way to assert on the idea that those populations are so beyond queer or do not have any queer mm -hmm. aspects that that would be the worst possible punishment for them. And it really joins with um, sort of what we've seen in kind of torture techniques and US torture techniques. Uh, stemming from the book uh, The Arab Mind by Rafael Batai, that Arabs are most vulnerable, Muslims and, and Arabs are most vulnerable to sexual humil humil humiliation mm -hmm. and torture, that this will produce responses more than any other kind of torture, right? 
And so you see that kind of later, much later on with Abu Ghraib, right? That, and you know, this, this has been in handbooks, right, uh, also. So what, what am I talking about? So the, the point of all this, and you made a comparison between Iraq and Arab men, and I, and I don't have a sophisticated answer, but I do think that black populations, which can be Muslim, and they're mm -hmm. not only yeah. as Muslim, um, black populations are seen as less less queer, I would say, than Arab populations, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of stereotypes about, like you, you if there's this book by Todd Shepard called uh, Mal Decolonisation, or Ar Arabs, France, and I don't know what the English title is, okay. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be translated in English. And he talks about how when North African um, immigrants first arrived and became factory workers, their peers and their bosses were always making comments about them for appearing homosexual in the way they touched each other, mm -hmm. uh, the way they saluted each other. Uh, Arab, men, Arab masculinity is seen as very emotive, very oversensitive, you know, very much mama's voice also. Kind of like Italian masculinity in a way, you know. Um, but, so then there's that, and then Nasira Genif Sulaimas, who wrote a book called The Feminist and the Arab Boy, she talks about how those uh, affective traditions have kind of atrophy, that out of shame about these comments that people are making, this population um, sort of repressed or turned underground all these um, effective practices, mm -hmm. which today would actually complicate the picture of an overly rigid masculinity that is associated with the bon Dieu. But those, those forms of affection have been communitarianized in a way. It only happens outside of the view of sort of the French white mainstream, let's mm -hmm. say. So yeah, that's a long, it's a big topic, but uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? I have a question that um, kind of situates the main topic, of transgressive masculinity, mm -hmm. uh, in the um, uh, framework of uh, the voluntary and the involuntary. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of what you're interested in has to do with um, uh, forms of uh, voluntary transgressive masculinity, yeah. uh, and, 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 and and the kind of slippery point that you're um, at times concerned with, but at other times kind of like eliding, is how the uh, voluntary forms of transgressive masculinity um, uh, become involuntary racism, right? Uh, uh, and um, and and how like performances of transgressive masculinity then feed back into uh, uh, you know like like. Uh, uh, racial sexual violence um, mm -hmm. on Arab men and, and you know just in, in the world or something. Were you thinking about the comic strips? Or yeah, I was thinking example? about the comic strips and thinking like that the, that that guy is really stylish, actually, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and he even though a, all he wears is a, well, he has a <laughs> little, that word, but. like a fanny <laughs> yeah. hat, you yes. know, like, that I wouldn't associate with you know like a bug or something, mm -hmm. um, and like and Nikes, which is like clearly drawing on uh, some of the kind of fashion magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Um, uh, um, uh, images that you yeah. uh, presented. Uh, so I just, I just would um, ask if you could reflect uh, yeah. for a minute on how the voluntary uh -huh. uh, transgressive masculinity, right, the performances of um, Arab uh, 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 queer thug, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, uh, so re reaffirm. Um, but I'm interested in exploring what violence. you mean by involuntary racism. But I'm, but I'm going to say what I think, and you, you can give me feedback. Um, so a, a couple of things about those items that you were talking about. So a fanny pack, and this is very funny to me because I think it reminds me of other conversations I've had about men's style of dress, in both in the Arab world and the diaspora. Like wearing a galabiya, which is a gown. Uh, there's nothing more masculine to like an Egyptian man than wearing that and then like, you know, playing with your balls and like, you know, just like being a, a, a douche basically. Uh -huh. <laughs> but here it seemed like when I wear that, my roommate was like, oh, are you wearing your nighty? You know, like, and I had to like make this like defiant gesture of like how masculine this is and it was kind of embarrassing. Um, but uh, so the fanny pack similarly is not considered a feminine at all. Here in America, it's associated, I don't know, with 90s, maybe early 90s, rollerblades. Uh, when, I would, when I had a fanny pack and I was rollerblading, uh, my dad said, those are fruit boots. And he, he, was a, 
He, but he was joking. He knew, he knew I was like dating without him saying anything. <laughs> I had a very funny household. Um, anyway, so there's fanny packs and there's also these things which I think Americans would call man purses. Mm -hmm. But they're these over the shoulder small strip pouches that you see a lot of all you guys wear. Sometimes they have knockoff like Louis Vuitton kind of logos. That's a whole other thing about counterfeit mm -hmm. clothing and Balneo re-manipulations re of them. Anyway, so those would be seen as man purses, but those are seen as extremely virile um, items of clothing. And why do they have that? Because they don't want to put all their junk in their pockets and take away from their lines. You know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, working out is another thing. But, okay, so to go back to what you said earlier, I think what I... What I imagine when you say that is sort of like how homosexuality will dress a certain way, but in sort of his own like excitement about how erotic, and he's not real, right? He's the figment of this person's imagination, but he's, he's the result of a lot of impressions that this illustrator has, right? But I think homosexuality is maybe pushing his autoeroticization to the extreme, and he thinks that that effeminate twink wants to be roughed up. And maybe that's not what that person wants, right? Of course. But uh, there's a whole sort of, um, I think it's called like the, like the double phantasm, where you are making your own image uh, in reaction to what uh, society says your image should be. Mm -hmm. And you're doing, an, uh, you're doing a, you're going so far in the other direction that you're actually doing violence to yourself because you're not even thinking about who you really are. You're thinking about how opposite you want to be from society's image. It's kind of related also to the Du Bois double mm -hmm. consciousness, you know, of having to always imagine how you're being perceived and saying, fuck it, I'm just going to be your worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they're finding, oh, I'm even more attracted as your worst nightmare, and it starts this like cycle where you're only negative consequences can occur. That's right. You know? yeah. So there's a theorist, actually, Nasira Genif Sulaimas, who wrote this book, uh, The Feminist and the Arab Boy, where she talks about how this kind of sort of, in French you say concurrence, or like a, com a competition of virilism, right, mm -hmm. will get to a point where these men have uh, a lack of care of, for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like the peril of masculinity, the peril of virility, is that you have to do ever more grandiose and risk-taking gestures to be considered a man. Uh, and you see a version of that in this, um, in this kind of gay phantasmagoria, where uh, what is the logical outcome of that? Like, real violence, real you know, non-consensual relations, like, and you know, uh, I, I, may, I may be going on a little bit, but there is a real uh, sort of parallel to this in sort of what you see on like Craigslist or like personal ads in France, where um, North African men are constantly approached in gay clubs and asked, how much? Hmm. Or can you come to my house? I want to yeah. organize a gangbang, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are startled and mm -hmm. don't want to go back to these clubs because they don't fit in that violent envelope. Mm -hmm. But there are other people who like that, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And Tumblr has all these blogs about mm -hmm. domination, interethnic yeah. domination, uh, cuckolding, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. things like that. I spent too much time on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one more question? Mm -hmm.